Ladies and gentlemen, in the blue corner, standing at a sleek 5 foot 11, 245 pounds, the tumultuous tempest of technique, Thomas Lilly. And in the red corner, at a curvaceous 5 foot 11, 315 pounds, the jovial juggernaut of judgment, John Cheryl Sheridan. A meeting of the masters of mastication. Turn your attention as they delve deep into all things lifting and more. This is Peak Speak. I'm not built for bodybuilding. You and me both. Mine's not got nothing to do with posing fitness. It's I'm <laughs> we, fat. These are the CB brand, which is a ripoff. It's basically exactly the same. The guy that used to run AS started a spin-off brand called CB. Um, but I got the muscle fit thinking, oh, this will be more shaped. Because you know you get the Gildan like straight tees and they're like dresses. Anyway. Yeah, they're not, they're not when you're yeah. fat. But anyway. They're really like wide and short <laughs> rather than, yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. So I was like, oh, I'll get the muscle fit because it'll be more shaped. But it's a muscle fit for really skinny people. So all the shirts that I sent out are a size too small for everyone. And it's been a real pain in the ass. It makes me feel amazing because 2XL is tight, but I know it's a false... Uh, yes. It's a false economy. Yeah, well, I want one of the blue on black ones. Bring it to Pro Raw, and I'll bring you one of these sick black on black Sounds good. ones. Yeah, I like the black on black. Or I, or I might get uh, one of the rainbow ones that we're doing for the... Um, it's almost like you ripped company. off SBD. Like, SBD was the original black on black, and everyone was like, wow... Look they, how innovative they, they are. They've created Black on Black. What an amazing company. I'm going to spend all my money on sleeves that I don't need. Yeah. yeah. Uh, look, if you wanted to get into a hobby to not spend money, powerlifting's <laughs> probably the wrong one. Uh, I think plenty of people like to go down. And look, fuck man, you're talking to an equipped <laughs> lifter. Like you and I both both know all about spending money. Oh, like I spent 110 bucks on sleeves. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. I spent like a thousand. Congrats! You want to put on three kilos? There's another four hundred dollars on the suit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I've got a fat <laughs> suit and a skinny suit. I've got. I've only ever. Ha I have one multi ply suit and one single ply suit, and I've worn them from ninety five kilos to one hundred and fifteen kilos. Mm, damn mm. carryover, son. Yeah, I got um. I got my original metal ace uh, and that was the one I squatted in up until I got too fat for it and I realized I couldn't actually mm -hmm. hit depth anymore uh, and then I got a size you know point. what actually speaking of equipped this is probably the perfect way to start this conversation because I think equipped is like Excellent. the original bro science do this because everyone else says to do it sit back arch up yes chest out tuck all those yes. things coming from that age where people start just doing that stuff because that's what everyone yelled what do you reckon yeah yeah i think maybe that's we should bring the people on board so they um, have any idea what the fuck we're even talking about no no uh if you can't follow thomas's and i's uh, stream of conscious thought process then you shouldn't be listening anyway <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Thomas and I, prior to pressing record, were discussing uh, what we're going to talk about because we're real prepared and hashtag professionals at this podcasting game, and we'd you know had a planned outline for every episode we've ever done. Uh, and I was talking about uh, the day I spent listening to Ben Pakalski and Jordan Chalo recently. Uh, I think by the time this episode comes out, the episode where I talked to Jordan will have come out hopefully you all enjoy listening to that as much as i enjoyed having that conversation um but i think one of the biggest takeaways from jordan's half of the the day for me was the idea of uh muscle function versus muscle muscle action right now uh i am certainly guilty of this in the past and this has been a, a bit of a change for me like in the last two weeks it's really flipped how I think about things a little bit <coughs> excuse me uh, 
But so Jordan talks about the, the difference between the, you know, the anatomical breakdown of what a muscle function is, right? So uh, using like, let's say your bicep, it connects into the bones of your forearm and into your shoulder. I don't know. I forget the anatomy. Um, but the, the action of the muscle would be what happens when the muscle flexes and brings the origin and insertion closer together, right? That's the muscle action. So your bicep flexes your elbow, your quadricep flexes your knee, those sort of things. Uh, that is a relatively... Oh, this is really, really testing your uh, physiological knowledge right now. I I get really bad at remembering all of that anatomy like i can look at it as a whole piece but i forget all the origin and insertion shit because i'm good at rote <laughs> learning like i can memorize things for an, an anatomy uh for an anatomy exam but i'm not very good at uh, remembering it beyond that uh but yeah essentially it's the difference between what happens when the muscle flexes and, and generates movement and how that action integrates into a multi-joint systemic movement like a squat or a deadlift or a bench press uh the example jordan uses like things like clamshells and like glute activation where they address the action of the muscle say you're looking at like your glute med which externally rotates from the hip and so you lie on your side and you lift your knee up and you do some jane fondas and you look real cool and you get a sick booty pump and then you go squat that's addressing muscle action but not function because the function of the glute meter and a lot of that glute complex is to stabilize the hip in motion uh, predominantly in walking because that's the big motion that your hips do and thus the best way to challenge those sort of things is to to add an element of instability to things rather than just isolating the function of the muscle so it, for me it's changed a little bit about the way i think about warm-ups and movement prep uh and i'm still sort of processing this in case you can't tell from my rather haphazard explanation of it um but that led us into a discussion about why and we're gonna talk about yeah so why. what you were just talking about there is the role of muscles instability rather than just what they do right so exactly what you said action versus function yeah um and having that understanding really is then going to define what kind of exercises you use, how you approach those exercises and how you perform those exercises. Uh, because the quality of the movement is going to dictate how much carry they, that carry over they have into your main lifts. And as powerlifters, if we're talking about powerlifting right now, all we care about is does our squat get better? Does our bench get better? Does our deadlift get better? And too often people are doing things without questioning why they're doing them. So for example, that, that, uh, that kind of, um, approach that Jordan takes talking about action versus function is really important to understand. So you just use a really good example of like clamshells and uh, hip stability or clamshells versus hip stability. Another great yep. example, everyone's doing external rotations, internal rotations with the band. Think about when you squat, when you bench and deadlift, are you doing this with your shoulders? No, they're creating torque, they're maintaining torque and they're holding that as an isometric through the movement. And that's an important way of looking at what those muscles actually do in terms of stability while you're moving. So if we're, if we're talking about stability, what stability really is, uh, is, uh, is resisting force. So resisting getting out of yep. position, stopping you from being all over the place while you're doing a squat, a bench and deadlift. So you're not trying to actively externally rotate your shoulder while you're doing a bench press. You're just trying to resist the force of going in the other direction. And likewise, you're not trying to internally rotate the shoulder. You're just trying to resist the force of going in, in, in the other direction. So think of it like an isometric co uh, contraction around the joint. With hips and shoulders, that stability, that rotation, uh, that force is coming from rotation. So it's a rotational isometric. That's what we refer to as torque. So we're trying to set torque, hold that torque throughout while our shoulders and hips are going through flexion and extension. So training muscles to just do their action is then kind of defunct. You know, you, you make uh, the action of external rotation stronger. That's not necessarily going to carry over into your bench. From a neural perspective as well, again, it, you're not doing this when you bench. You're not doing a clamshell when you squat. I think there is a point to regress to those movements for people who are extremely weak or have had some sort of injury 
but that's just temporary to get them to a point where they can perform the yeah. stability exercise that they need to perform to carry over into the main lift. But the heart of this question, uh, the heart of this conversation ha has been really, or that we've, we've come up with has, has been just questioning everything, saying, why are we doing this? Because in powerlifting, in lifting in general, in the fitness world, there's a lot of do this, do this, do this, uh, with, with no reason behind it besides I got taught that this is right, so therefore you should do it. So it's something uh, I've gone now into a lot more mentoring of, of coaches and teaching them how to coach the lifts, teaching them how to, how to understand movement. And something that uh, I really focus on when I'm mentoring someone is I'm, I'm saying, okay, here's a squat. Tell me why you're going to cue this. And they'll say, well, okay, we're going to cue knees out. Okay, why? Uh, because knees in is bad. Why is knees in bad? Oh, because it's going to put uh, more force through the knees. Why is that a bad thing? Just keep asking why, trying to get deeper and deeper and deeper until you hit a point where they're like, I don't know. It's like, well, you need to have that base level of understanding, that really in-depth understanding so that the thing at the end that you're actually presenting to the end user makes sense to you. The important thing of having that background understanding is that then you can apply the understanding to a range of different presentations. It's exactly the same in terms of nutrition. So you could learn all that you need to know about performance nutrition easily off the internet doing little internet courses. But you may not ever understand the uh, underlying biochemical processes that are happening. And even though you won't always need to refer to those, there are going to be special cases where you need that understanding and that's going to make those little light bulbs click. That's why education is so important, right? It's just figuring out more about why. Yeah, it's, it's context, right? That's the the really important thing to understand is the deeper your understanding goes like you said in movement in nutrition whatever that is the more you can apply your framework to different contexts right uh, contexts mm -hmm. uh so like the you mentioned before the regressing to you know clamshells and things like that for people who are really weak or who are coming back from injury jordan touched on that as well uh, this idea that like having the regression and having the understanding that you can go back to something like that as even just as a teaching tool like here do these clamshells can you feel that in your bum that's mm -hmm. what your bum feels like you know that's what it feels like when your glutes are doing some work and those sort of things because some people just have no like really no proprioceptive ability they have no concept of where they are in space they haven't done any movement uh, like i tend to see a lot of like beginners and very very early novice lifters who in person that is um and a lot of them have got into fitness and lifting and things like that relatively mm. late in life you know like you and i have both been training now for long enough that we it, it's become part of our lives right it's just something we've always done whereas some people if you've you know maybe you played some sport in primary school like early high school but then after high school you haven't done anything physical or active except for sit at a desk and drive to and from work and then suddenly you come into the gym at 30 you're going to have some yeah. things you're going to need to learn right some ideas of like learning how to move your body learning what it feels like where you when your body's in a relatively good and a relatively bad position so you know, i use a framework for how i think about coaching that's like a three-part system of uh connection control and capacity so uh it's the the sort of way i think about how i teach that's the the framework that i've reverse engineered out of what i'm teaching uh and simplified things so it's explainable but essentially connection is the important one first because if you don't know where your body is in space then any cue i give you is not going to have any relevance to you right if you don't understand what pushing your knees out or you know maintaining your brace or anything like that feels like me giving you an external cue about it's not going to make any difference uh the connection is important but you've got to know where you are in space you've got to know what it feels like when you get that feeling of like oh that didn't feel right and you've got to know what a relatively smooth and and a good feeling uh movement is right that really smooth fluid like oh, oh that felt really good if you can understand the two extremes of that, then we can start to talk about, okay, what everything else in the middle feels like and where you need to improve that. From connection, you move into control. So you're aware of where you are. You understand what, uh, 
it feels like when you move and what you should be thinking about or at the very least what you should be aware of and then you move into control where it's like about okay now we need to deliberately manipulate your position to put you in a stronger safer more efficient movement pattern right as you master that you get better at the skill you build the skill set then we can work on capacity then it's about weight on the bar sets and reps uh, and if you skip, if you try and skip those two steps, and I think a lot of people really do, it's very, very easy to get strong, right? You've just got to work hard for mm-hmm. a long period of time and you'll get strong. Plenty of really subpar intelligence people have got incredibly strong, but inevitably they put a rate limiter on it by not understanding their body and how they move and what they need to focus on and what good positions feel like. So they hit that point where it doesn't work anymore. So you've got to be able to build the context for the capacity right you've got to have a framework for your understanding of how you move and it's it's obviously individual everyone moves a little bit differently but the base level anatomy physiology biomechanical stuff Mm -hmm. is all the same right like you said it's then just different presentations of that um and i think i've certainly been guilty in the past of not thinking critically enough about what i'm doing uh and i'm over the last few years making a concerted effort to question myself more than anything else but then having conversations with you and and other people in the industry who i respect is a really great way to solidify my knowledge jordan talked about being uh critical to the Mm. point of being cynical uh with the view that you should be able to question everything you know because the more you strongly believe something the more likely you are to ignore things they mm-hmm. go in the opposite direction, right? You're, you're going to get confirmation bias. That's what that is. You find the evidence that proves your point rather than looking at the evidence as a whole and getting a, a more holistic mm. picture of things. Uh, he then, the other thing he said was that, like, what that means is the things that Jordan believes and knows, he'll take to the grave because they're the things that he's tested, ideas he's tested and floated and explained to people and conversed with people and tried to pull apart. Uh, and I think, especially as a coach, that's a really, really important skill. Being open to principles, not methods. So having, like, here are the principles that build my understanding of coaching and movement and things like that. And then how do I apply those principles to this scenario mm-hmm. or that scenario? And I think, especially in powerlifting, people get a little too mm-hmm. caught up in methods. Like, oh, I do West Side Method or I do rts or shaco or like something like that where it's it's a like it becomes a badge of honor you know like a i wear this method as this Mm -hmm. is the best way to do things and i think the best coaches i've had interactions with don't talk about methods they have a method and they often sell you know uh, an ebook of some program but the predominant uh, message in their education is principles here understand the underlying principles because Mm -hmm. then you can learn if all you do is follow a blank method or like a really cookie cutter method then you're missing out on a very important yeah and so you've you've kind of moved the conversation as well to to highlight that you know this asking why this understanding why it doesn't just extend to how we move but it also extends everything we're doing in in powerlifting so it extends to all of your programming as well it extends into your nutrition It, it extends to everything there has to be uh a deeper understanding to those methods um we're in a funny age as well like it's interesting here you say hearing you say i do west side i do 531 i, I do whatever um because even though that kind of still exists that was really true when we were getting into powerlifting you know eight nine ten years ago uh because how many people are your people fucking get that shit get that shit like <laughs> yeah, tattooed on their yeah. arms and stuff um like, dude, if you ever come to my gym with a Burley logo on your tattoo on your arm, I'll fucking slap you. You know, you think about your first nationals. Think of how many people at your first nationals, if Instagram existed right now, uh, back then, at your first nationals, how many of them would have tagged their coach in it? Well, probably next to no one because no one had a coach. We're in an interesting age now when having a coach is like an accessory. Having a coach is cool. Oh, coach told me to do this. Oh, I've got a coach. The The amount of people that now come into the gym and they're like, I'll be like, you know, this is the membership price. 
membership is, is inclusive of programming because uh, I only sell one membership package and it's just like you get access to the gym and you get bonus programming. The programming isn't factored into the price. And they're like, oh, can you make it cheaper? Yep. I've got a coach. I'm like, congratulations. I've got a car. Let's talk about something relevant now. It's like having a coach is really cool. It's like sexy. It's like an accessory. Oh, I can tag my coach. Coach told yep. me to do this. Coach is going to be really mad at me. Uh, and people just follow that shit blindly. So many people don't ask why. My favorite clients are the ones that are like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? This doesn't, I've done this in the past. Why aren't I doing this? And it's interesting. I was having a, co a conversation to someone who's been one of my longest standing online clients. And now I've been doing the online thing for, it's coming up to, you know, four or five years. And uh, been coaching now yeah. for six or seven years and it's really cool to have clients that have been long-term clients like that and I can talk to them about new concepts and be like this is why we don't do this and, and then be able to laugh with them and be like that's like what I religiously programmed and what we all did in the gym you know five or six years ago I'm like never ever we don't ever need to do that uh, it's really cool to see that yeah. evolution happening yeah, man, if you don't look back and you're not a little bit embarrassed by the programs you wrote five years ago, I don't think you've grown <laughs> yeah. very much. Yeah, exactly. I um, I think that, we, and we've talked about this before, uh, the idea of internal versus uh -huh. external authority. So I, the thing with coaching is it becomes this, uh, I'll just do whatever you say thing. Like I, you know, me giving you my money is me believing in you. And I'll just do what you tell me. And like, you know, don't get me wrong. I enjoy people that just do the mm. program as it's written. But in case you can't tell by this point, and if you've listened to our podcast for long enough, you probably can. Thomas and I quite like talking about this stuff. It's quite enjoyable. Like I have a fun time talking about these things and I enjoy unpacking my thinking to people. And that often results in a really... Like in some cases, it results in a really stag, uh, segmented and like really hard to piece together conversation because I'm trying to run the thought process in my head and get the thoughts from a, this is my understanding with my knowledge and my experience and how can I distill that in a way that explains it to someone who doesn't have a university level anatomy education or mm. things like that, right? So... I like I really enjoy having these conversations and I actually I put a post in our members group the other day encouraging people to ask questions to ask for help to like coaching is a two-way relationship right and we, again we've talked about this before it has to be a two-sided thing you can't just not say anything and run a program and then at the end of 12 weeks you haven't made any progress and say oh well mm -hmm. the coaching was bad like you'll get out of coaching what you put in but if what you put in is just blind faith and an unquestioning approach to just doing everything that's written, then maybe you're not getting the most out of the relationship because I think a good coach, it, it should be an educational process. Like my goal as a coach and from the first day I was a personal trainer was always mm -hmm. to make myself redundant, right? Like I want to give you enough information that you don't need me anymore. And I can still be there to consult with people. And I've got people like that who have been a member of my gym for long enough that now they mm -hmm. write their own programs, but they still talk to me about it. And go, okay, here's what I have planned. Do you think this is reasonable? I'll offer my thoughts and explain my thinking. And it becomes more of a consultation, which I really enjoy because I enjoy discussing the theory behind things and talking about different ways to do things and stuff like that. So for some people, it's a much more mm. collaborative approach potentially early in your powerlifting strength training career you do need a little bit of just like shut up and do the work but that doesn't mean you can't ask questions about why because if your coach is like oh we just do it because i told you to mm -hmm. your coach is a dickhead um and probably doesn't have the understanding of it right they're they're uh, maybe a step ahead on that why ladder but they're not very far ahead and I think uh, the more questions you ask, the more you're going to learn. And potentially what you're going to learn is your coach doesn't know as much as they think. Um, and that's okay. You know, yeah. That's a good lesson. And you, you, I mean, you're 100% right. We fucking love talking about this stuff. It made me think, I've got a member at the gym. Shout out to Steve Wang. Steve Wang is the best guy ever. Um, Steve Wang trains consistently at like 8.30 p.m. And I, I leave the gym normally between 7.30 and 8.30 
Uh, sometimes I'll stay quite a bit later, but normally between 7 and 30 and 8.30, I'm out the door. And so for anyone who knows me, I'm an asshole, but I'm like Dr. Jekyll and uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Wait, am I doing that backwards? Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll. Uh, anyway, no, I'm like I Dr. Asshole right. and Bigger Asshole. So asshole most of the time, but after sort of 6.30, 7 p.m. where I, my body's like, okay, man, you need to go to sleep. It's like exponential asshole. So Steve Wang always catches me at the worst time. He's coming in while I'm going out. I've already mentally checked out. And this guy, I've never known anyone who consistently can create so many questions on training and programming, like just consistently. I'm talking almost every single session. And I'll always answer him. And I like talking about it. And he catches me at the worst times. But I mean, I love that. I love that he can ask anything and we can talk about it and I can justify it and I can solidify my own beliefs and my own program and I can help his learning and understanding. Like, that's really fucking cool. Um, I think where, where we should move to from here is maybe picking apart a few of the big things that uh, pop up. I've got one thing in mind that I want to talk about and maybe while I'm talking about that, you can think about one thing that is kind of just like yep. uh, preached and put out there. There's so many of them in this whole powerlifting space. There's so many global benchmarks and so many global teachings that we just exist by in the powerlifting world that no one really questions. Um, you know, things... Uh, yeah, i, I got to be careful because I'll start ranting and I'll sound like a fucking idiot. But I think... Uh, Angry Thomas is <laughs> a big one, Thomas. A big one and a simple one and one that's going to be easy for everyone to digest is this whole idea of knees out and squatting. Right, everyone knows that we want our knees out and we don't want our knees in and knees caving in and touching together is a bad thing. Uh, and it's kind of, it, it's this global benchmark that exists that's kind of misleading because it undermines the biome biomechanical complexity of what's happening when we squat at our hips and what we're actually trying to achieve. So I spoke about and touched on a little bit earlier this idea, idea of rotational force being torque and the fact that we want to set torque at the joint and hold that joint throughout the movement. So we don't actually want our knees to go out. We just don't want them to fall in. Uh, but even then, that's big, that's come from a pro problem solving perspective. It's like knees are more common to go further in than further out. What we're really trying to say is we don't want our knees to deviate from a central position where they're stabilized in the middle, right? So we don't want them out, we don't want them in. In my coaching experience, in terms of actual uh, injury, in terms of actual presentation with pain and problems at the hips or at the knees, more often than not, it's coming from knees going too far out than caving in a little bit. More often than not, people are getting their hips beat up by, their, by cranking their hips right out, by jamming their knees out as far as they can, rolling on the, onto the outside of their foot, and then creating this moment of hip impingement at the bottom of the squat, which is then going to manifest in like this syndrome where you're getting really tight through glute mid and piriformis and TFL and stemming down to ITB. You're getting this pulling in your knee, this horrible complex that people run into, or just classic hip impingement, feeling like someone's stabbing you in the front of the hip when you're squatting and deadlifting. More often than not, that's coming from people jamming their knees out rather than their knees falling in. So if we pick it apart, it's like, what do we actually want our knees to do? And it's like, well, knees and ankles are just a visual representation of what's happening at the hips. We don't want to think about our knees or our ankles. The further that you're going to cue away from the source of uh, the biomechanics, the worse off you're going to be. So if you're cueing at the knee, you're missing the point. We want to be cueing up at the hips. We want to stabilize the pelvis create torque at the hips and then just maintain that torque as you're going through. So for example, with my lifters, uh, you may have heard the cue of like screwing your feet into the floor. Again, that's achieving the same thing. That's getting away from knees out, creating torque more at the hip rather than just pushing your knees out in an abduction moment. But that's cueing too far away from the, from the actual source. And what you'll find is that people start talking that rotation through their knee rather than their hip. So the cue that I use for my lifters is to twist their quads away from each other and to hold that. And really, we've spoken about this in the cueing episode. That cue is just to elicit a feeling of what tension feels like at the hips and then chase that. Uh, uh, I'm, just I'm just standing here rotating. Yeah, and when you do that, you attention. can feel your hips switch on, right? Yeah, that's that's a really I've I've not thought about that as a um, 
as a queue before and it's mm. a really good queue i like that. uh and even that i mean it's not like just rotate your quads away from each other and you fixed your squat that's part of a very complex system without the pelvic stability that you're going to see the the same issues manifest if you don't have the prerequisite stability to actually hold that while you're squatting uh, it's like, well, I'm doing the QE said, but I can't maintain it. It's like, well, fuck, you need to bring up that stability into the movement. So you need to do stability work. And it's like, well, do the stability work. Well, I'm still not getting better at squat. Well, you need to manifest that in the movements that kind of lead up into it. Uh, so it's more to it than, sorry, camera stopped recording. More to it than what meets the eye. Anyway, that's that's kind of the a good example of why having an understanding of the deep processes is important. And this is why coaching is important because as a lifter, you probably don't need to go to great lengths to learn all this stuff. I mean, that's up to you and how much you want to understand this stuff. As a pure athlete, you need to rely on people, or if you have a coach, you need to rely on that coach to be able to understand this stuff. That's our role as coaches. Your role as a, of a lifter is to learn from us that. We want to impart, impart that on you. Or if you're a self-coach lifter, then you need to get good at understanding this stuff as well. So you can really question, why am I actually doing this? And just saying because everyone else does it, or just saying because I read it in this article, probably isn't enough. Yeah, and I think that um, sort of ties into a discussion that I'm fairly sure we had in our episode on weaknesses and identifying weaknesses and stuff. But the thing that gets me is often people saying like, oh, well, like I, uh, and an example Jordan used was uh, uh, deadlift lockouts and mm. saying my glutes are weak. Uh, and so people do like Fucking hip bridges hell. or hip yeah. thrusts, right? Yeah, like, so this was really interesting and Jordan got really close to just uh, ranting so hard that perhaps Brett Contreras <laughs> would sue him. Um, but he talked about that, the problem with uh, glute, uh, sorry, like a hip thrust, right? Like barbell across your hips, back on a bench, extending your hips up to lift a weight off the floor. You're training your glutes in hip extension, but in a way that doesn't apply or directly carry over to squats and deadlifts, right? Because that's training the glute complex in isolation in that position. Uh, and a lot of people end up being able to hip thrust the shit out of a huge amount of weight, but then don't have the requisite uh, core stability overall motor control to transfer that into squats and deadlifts right you're you're training a, a muscle that you think is weak you know let's say in the deadlift for example on oh, my lockout sucks so my glutes must be weak well that's not necessarily the case there's a pretty good chance at least in my experience as a coach that if your lockout sucks it's because your start mm -hmm. position shit. it undermines the complexity um, of the movement and the system ex exactly you're it's a really simplistic view of things which i think probably stems from equipped lifting which like maybe and this is me like thinking on the fly which is never a good idea um maybe in equipped while it's obviously a slightly more complex movement because you're adding in the factors of the, sh the shirt or the suit or whatever but you also then can compartmentalize weaknesses a little bit more because there's a really distinct difference between the point in the movement where you're getting the most help from the suit and the point in the movement where you're not getting as much help from that so uh jordan used the reverse hyper example um again it's it's training uh like glutes erectors all that stuff in an isolated action approach that if you're squatting really wide in a squat suit where the suit does most of the work for two thirds of the lift, maybe you do need some like real top end hip extension strength because at that point, you know, all you're doing is just mm. locking the movement out. And that's why Westside preached it and they got really big on it because it, it mm. worked for them, right? It worked for their context. Would I use it for mm. an equipped lifter? Probably not. Um, but it's a really good standing desk in my gym um and a good leaning mm, station if you're holder. feeling tired but yeah exactly but uh but it's understanding that they're doing it for that particular reason right so in equipped i think it's probably easier to isolate muscles in in identifying weaknesses than it is in a raw lift because i think and feel free to 
you disagree with me here, but I think it, it makes it a slightly less complex system because by the time you get to the point where the shirt's not doing any more work in your bench, all the only thing left for your body to do is lock your elbows out, which is almost exclusively mm-hmm. a tricep exercise. Uh, and so maybe that's like maybe that's a way of justifying that approach, but I don't think it's a way of a good way to look at a raw lifter. Because, it, it, like you said, it undermines the complexity mm-hmm. of the process. Your muscles aren't necessarily weak. Maybe you're just shit. And maybe you need to just be better at lifting. And then you can deal with particular muscles. But, again, you've got to be able to address that muscle in a from a function standpoint, not just mm-hmm. the action standpoint. Yeah, I think the, the equipped conundrum is that if you can lift super maximal weights it's like the 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 equipment's doing its job and you know how to use it and and i think people stop questioning there it's like how much more could you get out of that shirt if rather than ignoring the fact that you lose shoulder stability at the bottom and let the shirt do the work what if you could maintain the shoulder stability gather more because shirts shirts work on the principle of creating more instability basically so if you can resist that instability and hold your line, you'll create more torque through the shirt, which gives you more pop or more torque through the suit. So imagine the position you don't want to be in when, when you squat, back hunch it over, knees caving in. That's what the suit is telling you to do. You fight that by holding your hips open, by cranking your back tightness, and the suit torques up, it gets tight, and that's how you get more pop out of it. And um, I think in the less experienced lifters that are wearing equipment, they well, it's not even a matter of experience the less technically inclined rather than getting good at the actual movement and more technically proficient uh they just add a stronger shirt add a tighter shirt add a tighter suit yeah and um, man and that's so common in equipped lifting like i tell people all the time like when i squatted 410 i wasn't mm. very strong like I, I got really good at equipped lifting, or I think I got reasonably good at equipped lifting because I got a lot mm-hmm. out of my equipment without being super strong. You know, like I squatted four ten in a multiply suit and wraps, and at the time my best squat in a belt and sleeves was probably like two forty, two forty five. Mm-hmm. I benched two ten, and I probably should have benched like two thirty that day, but I fucked my opener up twice. Um, I my best bench at that point was like 155 yeah. maybe 160 raw and that was in a single ply shirt so equipped's just it's such a different ball game that like like i imagine and i don't quite have the experience to speak on this as an authority but i imagine it's like a lot of people's approach to uh, performance enhancing drugs right mm. like more is better more equipment more drugs more volume more's just and relying on it without thinking um you've yes and exactly that's what where i was going to go there was that like adding more of something might not Mm. be the best option like the the common ones number of training days a week right people come and go i'm thinking about adding a fifth day okay why more volume bro be better yeah but yeah but why and I think I like I do that to people all the time. Just keep asking why until they get to that point where they're mm-hmm. like, I, I don't know. Okay, cool. Well, at least we got to the heart of your thinking and we can reverse engineer mm-hmm. the process from there. That's the, the important part is... It, it's not that I expect you to have an answer to every why that I ask. It's just that I want to understand where your base level of knowledge is so that we can get an idea of... Uh, of what you're focusing on or what your intent behind adding something or you know, yeah. taking it out is. Yeah, I mean, the equipped thing's a funny thing. Uh, the, the most common thing you hear about equipped is, oh, it's more technical. I actually strongly disagree with that. I don't think it is more technical at all. In fact, I think the technique in equipped is exactly the same as in raw. And if you're talking about the technique of the actual lifts, what I will say is that it's more volatile. Uh, yes, the margin for error much is smaller. much, much smaller. Uh, Wait, much greater, you mean? Do I? No, I think it's much smaller. The window for the margin of error. You've got a smaller window. Of, uh, well, now you're talking about a different thing. You're talking about the window of, into the margin. The actual margin is much greater. More can go wrong. This is like... You know yeah, how Americans yeah. say... Uh, 
uh, I could care less. No, no, no. You couldn't care less. That's the, yes. that's the heart of the saying. You're saying, I literally couldn't care any more yeah. less about this thing than I care right now. But they say, I yeah. could care less. And it's like, yeah. you've got so much more care to give to this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a valid yeah. point. You made a good point. <laughs> it's it's more volatile. It's more volatile and it requires yes. more technical pre precision. I think you have to be a better lifter technically because you have to yes. hold your line. You have to be... Uh, you know, one, one wrong move and it's game over because the weights are so super maximal. Um, so I think it manifests this idea, uh, it, it manifests the requirement of better technique. Uh, but that, getting into the equip path is kind yep. of uh, getting off track a little bit. One thing I wanted to talk to you about and ask you about a little bit, a, l a long while ago, I, uh, I made a story about pause deadlifts and people got really upset about it. Some exercises become flavor of the... You're really good... You're really good Pissing at people off. Uh, polarizing or just polarizing yeah, but people. Uh, it's good. I it, like, it, I like the, it. My, my end message is always like, if it works for you, do it. Like it's, it's always very neutral. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I'm really, but this, yeah, people get caught yeah, up in the identity of it. What do you mean? I do pause deadlifts and they're fucking it's like sick. like the whole healed hey. squats, the healed shoes and squats thing. Everyone thinks I hate heels. I'm like, where did this idea even come from? I don't fucking hate heels. Because people don't oh. listen to what you well, say, Thomas. Well, I'm glad I'm polarizing. I think I'm all right. Anyway. I think being uh, polarizing... I made a story thing. ages ago on Instagram about um, about pause deadlifts. And it ruffled some feathers. Uh, because I'm not a big fan of pause deadlifts. They're, they're one of the exercises... Back then, they were like real flavor of the month. Every fucking person on Instagram was doing pause deadlifts. At the moment, it's pin everything. Fucking pin presses, pin squats, pin benches. Soon, it's going to be rack pull deadlift pins and fucking uh, double pause squats with wraps yeah. to a high pin with one pin lower than the other fucking pin. Anyway, pause deadlifts were the flavor of the month back then. And... I, I, from every angle that I ask myself, why are you doing pause deadlifts? I can't, I can't find a good reason. And you, and you read the things that people say, and people say the same thing as everyone else. It improves position. I'm doing it for strength off the floor. I'm doing strength at this midpoint. I'm doing it to hold a better back tightness. Like all these reasons that people list, I'm like, we can do that better. We can do that better. We can do that better with a different exercise. So why are people gravitating towards pause deadlifts? And it's A, because everyone says the same thing. It's like, this is good for position. It's like, exactly. It Everyone says circuit. that. So people just believe it without actually questioning why. So what do you think yeah. of pause deadlifts? This is just an example, by the way. This is not a roast on pause deadlifts. Because again, you can, yeah. I'm sure you can find a reason to do them and do them well and have some sort of relevant carryover. I can't, I, I struggle finding that reason. So, yeah, no. And look, I've used them in the past. And what I... Because I, I fell into that category of like, yeah, it's better for your position and strength in that position and blah, blah, blah. The thing that pulled me away from it was less critical thinking and more just pattern recognition that a lot of people doing pause deadlifts, when they stop in that position, they drastically alter their body position to mm -hmm. hold the pause, right? The conventional deadlifts really, uh, it's really easy to see. They'll like and this is gonna be hard to demonstrate for anyone who's listening to this and go and watch the youtube video that's right we're on youtube because we're on multiple channels like hashtag professionals um so a lot of people in a conventional deadlift will come up and their hips and shoulders will be good and then they pause and they do this like their bum comes close to their knees shoot forward a little bit so that then you're not like it's not the same movement right you're pulling from a different position when once you get mm -hmm. past that stop point uh, I probably don't use pause deadlifters, deadlifts like really at all. I certainly wouldn't program them anymore. Uh, occasionally something like that has, I believe, some value in mm -hmm. being a teaching tool. So I quite like, uh, I like triple pause squats. Uh, so pause on the way down, pause at the bottom, pause on the way up. But I'd never do that as a training exercise. It's a mm -hmm. practice drill. And I think making the distinction between, you know, an assistance exercise and a movement skill mm -hmm. exercise are important. So when I'm using a triple pause squat, I'm using it for someone who uh, potentially they lack a really good control of their hip and you know, pelvis and, and core stability. Uh, potentially, they're just not very proprioceptively aware. So pausing just helps them understand what those movements feel like. 
these days I'm far more inclined to use ridiculous tempos like oh just do an eight second descent um, because that's really going to help you identify the positions and what it feels like so that's sort of where I lean towards now is is more just slowing everything right down and really forcing people to be in good positions and know what those positions feel like but yeah the only place I'd see for something like a pause deadlift is just in a in a teaching tool concept like I'm never going to you know load f- even 50% on there it's going to be a little bit of weight so you can feel what you're doing and then maybe we're just going to stop and identify things or you know do it that way so using it as a teaching tool rather than as a I'm trying to get you strong mm-hmm. with pause deadlifts um, because yeah I just I see so many people execute them really mm-hmm. really poorly uh, and that's the thing you've got to look at is that concept of dynamic correspondence right dave tate loved that it's all about getting uh getting the carryover right because the sport is squat bench and deadlift so everything you do in training has to be building your squat bench and Mm -hmm. your deadlift and the level of correspondence between some things and others is obviously going to be different but if you don't know why you're doing it and you're just doing it because you saw other people on instagram doing it then you're never going to be able to figure out what works Mm -hmm. for you and what doesn't so yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't use them anymore as a strength exercise, but potentially they have some value in a real dependent context uh, as yeah. a teaching tool. Yeah, I yeah. Think. And then that's a really good way of like, you know, exercises on paper don't necessarily correlate to the same end goal. And it's really easy to get confused with that because people can prescribe pause deadlifts for this reason, that reason, that, that reason. Or you can read pause deadlifts are good for this or rows are good for this. Rows are another classic example. Right rows, rows are good for back, back is good for deadlift bench squat. Okay, well, the performance of your row is greatly going to impact how you move during your row is greatly going to impact how well you move or how well you get into the right positions to squat bench deadlift. So if you're doing a row and you're going into this yeah. kind of rounded forward shoulder position, scaps are elevating. That's just actively teaching you to get in a bad position and manifest a worse position in those lifts. Or you can perform a row where you're actively keeping your scaps locked down, where you're going into thoracic extension, where you're going through the full range, where you're going through, uh, going into protraction and thoracic kyphosis at the end and leaning forward and, and going through that full range and training through that full range. That's going to actively make you better at those lifts and that it's going to have more relevant carryover. So the pause, the, my thinking process when it comes to the pause deadlift conundrum is like, okay, well, uh, I hold a pause just below the knee because that's where I lose position. I'm like, well, that's probably not where you lose position. In a per- yeah, it's where, where your position manifests to have lost it. But you, you lost, lost it right off the floor, earlier, that's right. Or you just can't see it happening. You don't yeah. know how to identify it. Because in a perfect moving system, yeah, exactly. everything goes easy, gets easier as we approach lock, lockout. The key point being there, a perfect moving system. It's like, well, well, I'm really fast off the floor and slow at lockout. Like, that's not a perfect moving system then. You've lost position along the way. That's yeah. why you don't see exactly. people fail their squat in the last two inches. They fail it at the bottom somewhere. They might get a big pop out of the hole because of wraps or because of the torque at their hips, but they fail at the bottom. They don't fail at the top. If they fail somewhere in the mid range, it's yeah. because they've lost position. They've lost uh, opportunity for leverage. They've lost the opportunity for the prime movers to do what they need to do at that point in time. So if you... And that's the... I think we touched on that in the weakness episode about like where you miss yeah, isn't where you exactly. fucked up. You know, like it, it's a little bit before that. You just miss two thirds of the way up because that's where the summation of all the forces in your slightly shitty bottom position have got to a point where you can't Mm. tolerate it anymore yeah so yeah exactly so you lose position did you say train position no you need to get better from the floor how are you going to get better from the floor hold a better position off the floor or do deficit deadlifts where you're holding a better position uh uh i do position because i'm weak at the knees okay well you're weak at the knees because you've lost position all right so you've lost position from the floor yes not at that point in the knees uh 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 well, I uh, pause my squats and bench. That's that's the that's the counter argument I get all the time. It's like, well, Thomas, you program pause squats and pause bench, so I've got you. You should do pause deadlifts. Well, no, fuck. Think about it for two seconds. In a squat or a dead a uh, squat or a bench, think about where we're pausing. We're pausing at the at the transition between eccentric and concentric. There's no eccentric in a deadlift. Our eccentric is the setup. So if we're doing pauses in the same manner, we'd be setting up in our position and then just holding our position and then pulling, right? 
we wouldn't be pausing mm-hmm. halfway up. That would be like doing a squat, then stopping halfway up and keep going. Which to me, like the, the example you used of how you might prescribe that makes sense. To me, I wouldn't prescribe it for that reason. I'd gravitate more towards a tempo squat just because the in the terms of training position, we're not training in a static position. Yeah. We don't need to hold a static position. Yeah, and look, I, and that's why I'm leaning mm. more towards tempos these days as well. I, I use it like the multiple pauses and stuff like that less i because my understanding is better i now just yeah. slow the fuck uh, and down. you know liken and it to the skill slow. of training any movement if you're training to have a better golf swing you're not going to swing halfway stop and then keep going so why would you do that with a deadlift yeah. if you're trying to improve holding the right line or the right position through the movement you just need to get better at doing the movement it's like why why spend why spend energy on doing stuff that doesn't have as much relevant carryover as other stuff? That's and again, that's not to say that pause deadlifts are fucking stupid and stop doing them. If they work for you, if you can find a way to justify them and they work and they have relevant carryover and you can identify that the addition of this yeah. exercise has helped me, that's I mean that's your evidence right there. Keep doing that thing. It, exactly. And that's the important thing is that it's not like we're not trying to demonize certain exercises Absolutely. or certain approaches. Like there's no, because we're talking about principles, right? We've already mentioned that once. This is a discussion about the principles behind mm-hmm. the process. If you don't understand the principles or you're unwilling to engage in the principles, then your method will fa- mm-hmm. fail eventually. But if you understand the principles, like fuck it, you can do anything and it'll work if you have a solid understanding of the principles and you can explain it. It's not that we're saying your training program sucks. It's that we're saying your understanding of why you're doing the things in your training program sucks and you need to improve that. Because in the end, it's about how you justify things. It's about like, fuck man, I can justify anything because I'm good at talking. (laughs) Like it's what I do for a living, right? I can give you a discussion about anything and eventually pull it back to something relevant. But it all stems from an understanding of those principles. You know, like you said, pause deadlifts aren't inherently bad as an exercise. They are often misprescribed and poorly executed, which doesn't make them bad. Uh, and I think that's the important takeaway because otherwise we're just going to do that thing that Thomas does regularly and piss a bunch of people off because they want to use bands and chains in their squat. I like bands. Not for squatting or deadlifting. Just for Pretty sick much. bicep pumps? Just before my angling for yeah, this. I think that is a very neat yeah. way to close this off. No. Angling for The way that you said it. I'm, not I'm not my trash. <laughs> Uh, yeah cool excellent give us five stars that sounds good I'll tell your friends maybe show your mum don't don't talk to my mum it's about it Um, and yeah my mum's never listening to my Jordan was like my mum listens to every episode man my parents would have no desire to listen to this nor do I really want them to my mum would probably be ashamed of me she'd probably rather tell everyone that I'm like a murderer in jail or something my son my son killed a guy oh really he just no, has he a just shitty has a podcast, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> alright guys talk to you next time I like that see ya <laughs>